And this is the third video, though a uh, second installment in the Patterns Everyone Must Know video series. Right now in front of you, you can see the list of tactical patterns that we have today. So from double attacks to pins and skewers, you know, the big three to to seeing a lot more of these other advanced discovered attacks and clearance sacrifices and windmills and all the stuff that you see in front of you. It's like eye candy, right? Because you're just so excited to learn chess today. We're going to start out with some double attack and fork examples, and uh, here we go. Our first position starts out white to play. Again, if you wanted to, you could have paused the video. White plays the move rook takes f6. Um, exclam, you see that this creates the potential for a fork after king takes f6, knight to uh, e4 check is a fork or double attack, however you want to call it. However, this position actually goes forward with the move rook takes c3, which is actually a desperado or swish and zoop move. So rook takes f6 is the brilliant first move for white, and again, the king can't take it because we fork alicious. And so after rook takes c3, this desperado move, which again is defined as a position where there are already pieces hanging. A desperado has to be where there are already captures possible, already some sort of craziness going on. Rather than just capturing, black has a desperado move, which is a very good one. And if white is to simply capture black, back, black would take, and now if you evaluate this king and pawn ending, black is probably better because white's three on two majority are nothing special given the fact that they're doubled. And uh, black has three pawns over here versus white's two. However, white has a follow-up further Desperado slash Swish and Zug move, an in-between move. Remember, a Desperado or, or Swish and Zug is played in between an otherwise obvious move, right? So it's like when I take here, the obvious move is to take back, but he finds this Desperado tactic making the position more murky and, and winning his material back. Now, instead of white just capturing back, obviously, white captures here with check, exclaim a biatch. Black has to take back, and after B, B takes C3, this is now a winning king and pawn ending. Why? Because in this ending, white has a two-on-one pawn majority. These pawns will be advanced and eventually traded. In that case, this outside pass pawn will actually serve as a decoy to move back to king over. White will win this pawn and win the end game. You can analyze it yourself, even for beginner players. If you want to turn on a computer and, and see that I'm right, you can do so. But it's basic king and pawn ending outside pass pawn principles, which is that a two-on-one majority, an outside pawn majority, is a decoy to move this king away so that your king eventually comes up. And when both kings start running over the rest of the pawns, Guess whose king is closer? White's king, because it'll be in the center of the board. So this is tricky. An advanced position, like I said, the average uh, expert probably wouldn't know the right evaluation to this position within a, just a couple minutes. But it is winning. And again, from the beginning, we see a double attack, potential, a fork. And uh, after the Desperado swish and zoo, White follows up with a Desperado of his own, creating a winning king and pawn ending because of the two-on-one majority. Next problem. So here, um, if you haven't paused your video, then um, go ahead and do so. But white is going to play the move knight f6 check. Exclam. Forcing black to capture is obviously moving the king allows main one. And after takes, takes, this is a double attack because white has opened up the possibility for two threats. One, queen to g3 check, followed by checkmate on g7. And the second, for example, if this check is guarded, is queen takes f8, followed by rook to d8, checkmate. So again, the double attack is knight f6 check. It starts with knight f6 check, and now we see that this position officially has uh, given white a double attack, a lethal one, as the threat of queen takes f8 and the threat of queen to g3 check are too much for black to bear. I purposely chose a position that was a double attack by definition, but had nothing to do with forking pieces or even, even necessarily the threat of taking one piece. Um, we wouldn't re really qualify this as a threat of taking a piece. It, it's a threat of checkmate, right? So here we see a double attack based on, based on the threats of checkmate, not necessarily the threats of winning any pieces. The third double attack I'm going to do is the same type of concept in that it is a double attack of, of two threats, two very powerful threats, but two threats indeed. Uh, white to play and win. If you haven't paused your video, go ahead. White plays the move queen to h6, threatening checkmate in one in two ways. Um, the only way to stop either one of those threats is queen takes e5. Um, and the, the other idea you unleash by putting your queen on h6 was the threat of queen takes h7, followed by king to g2. Double attack and fork is going to be concluded right now and beyond the basics officially, but we will, of course, see the theme repeated throughout other problems. Now we're going to move on to some pins. I really like the first one I've chosen here for a pin because it shows you that it, I think this really highlights what, it's, what taking your, your thought process to the next level is about. Seeing a pin by itself 
uh, when it's like a one mover right in front of you is it, not going to be a hard task. Once you familiarize yourself with the tactic and the pattern, um, you know, even for beginner players, they see a pin, they do a pin, right? But, but recognizing the potential for a pin, the potential for any one of these tactics, and seeing how your pieces sort of coordinate together, that sort of dynamic power that your pieces have whenever they're, for example, on the same diagonal as a king, or whenever there's a fork potential. Um, that's not really the idea of this particular position. I'm just showing that whenever there's a threat, whenever there's a potential threat, even if it doesn't work, like like 92 obviously wouldn't work. When you start to just always be aware of the, all the potential ideas you have in a position, you know you're getting better at chess. So I like this one because White's idea is to take advantage of a pin and execute a very powerful threat because of a pin, um, but it's not that obvious at first. The winning move here, um, I believe you can play it either move order, but the most accurate way to play this position for White is the move queen to d4. After this move, black, of course, can capture h1, but upon doing so, he immediately resigns to rook to g6, threatening checkmate on g7 in an, in an actually unstoppable manner, and uh, doing so, taking advantage of the pinned pawn. So I consider this a pin tactic, because what you're doing is you're taking advantage of a pin. Remember, a pin, one way to win a pin piece, remember, is to overload it by continuously attacking it, because it can't go anywhere. But a very common way to take advantage of a pin is to, is to overload it with excuse me, with responsibilities by, by recognizing what it can't necessarily guard. So this move queen to d4 is a brilliant one, and this threat is actually very hard to stop even if black doesn't take the rook. But let's say black could find a way to stop it. Queen d4 is a very strong move because it allows white to bring the piece over and to save it. Let's go on to the next pin here which is uh, definitely one of my personal favorites. This position is black to play, and uh, so I'll go ahead and flip it for you so you can see it from black's perspective. But the winning move is actually taking advantage of a double pin, queen to e2, exclaim a bianche. The bishop can't take the queen because of an absolute pin, right? And if the bishop takes the bishop, we have a relative pin that's almost as good, winning the queen, right? Look at this one in action one more time. We see a double pin. Can't take the queen because of an absolute pin. Can't take the bishop because of a relative pin. Black is completely lost, or sorry, white is completely lost and should resign. For beginner players who didn't uh, maybe get enough pin action in the first video, you should be pretty psyched up to see that one. What do we got? A double pin in this position that forces immediate resignation, overwhelming this piece on d3 and taking advantage of the two pins that exist in this position. Very nice tactic by Black. In this position, Black has a winning idea. If you want to pause the video, you can. The winning move is queen takes b3. First, you make a simple queen trade, and now you can execute a force mating net that's very well known. You sacrifice on h2, and after the king takes it, you play the move rook to h8 check, and after king to g1, knight to g3, threatening checkmate on h1, and unstoppable because of the pin on f2. Again, so we see the pin in action. First, we eliminate the queens, and uh, if we don't, by the way, we would have problems with checks on e6. So you trade the queens, and then you execute this tactic in a very, very powerful and forcing fashion, and it wins by threatening checkmate because the pawn on f2 is pinned. So again, we see another one of our basic tactical patterns repeated. Our uh, final example that will officially classify under pin, although already, of course, we'll be able to see more ideas existing here, but um, is, is a prophylactic one. Uh, in this position, the question is, should white play the move rook to c7, or should white simply trade queens and go into the winning uh, rook and pawn ending? If you want to pause your video, you can. Okay, if you chose the move rook to c7, you should now pause your video because you're wrong and think about what exactly black should do to be winning here. The winning move, if you haven't paused your video on moving forward, is rook to c5, double exclam. You'll see that this move takes advantage of, once again, two pins. The pawn can't capture on c5 because of queen to d1 checkmate immediately, while the rook can't capture c5 because of a pin here. So here we see a double pin, but not on the same one piece. The rook is not pinned twice, um, as technically it could move this way, but uh, doing so would be a deflection because by sacrificing this queen, We've, we've opened up the possibility for back ring checkmate. So look at this position again. We see that the move one rook to c7 is um, a powerful looking move, but actually loses on the spot because of the neglecting of, of your own weaknesses. Black plays the brilliant move rook to c5, taking advantage of one pin, either winning the queen, two pins, checkmating the king, or probably the best case scenario for you is to just free your back rank and, and go into an endgame down a whole rook. Very interesting example of, of taking advantage of a double pin, and if you did say that white should play rook to c7, it's a good prophylactic lesson for you to always be aware of how dangerous a back rank weakness is, and weaknesses in general before you get aggressive. Make sure you're putting your, your opponent's threats just as highly as your own. Let's move on to the next theme. We're going to go back to skewer now, the brother of the pin. 
We're back to white's perspective. And here we see immediately that white has the ability to play queen takes h7, skewering the king to the queen. Queen takes h7, a very strong move that skewers the king to the queen. However, upon a closer look, we see that this king can actually take a safe square on e6 and uh, for the most part be completely safe. Perhaps white will, uh, will finish the game with a perpetual check, but nothing else special is going to happen here. Of course, a move like moving to the 8th rank would lose to another skewer, skewering the king to the rook. But once we see that black has the ability to play king e6, you realize that this initial skewer of taking h7 actually didn't do too much. So what could white have done here in this initial position to uh, take advantage of the king and queen and to skewer on a much more powerful level? The move, of course, is rook to c7, exclam. After queen takes c7, queen takes h7, now we see the skewer of the king and queen hurt just a little bit more, right? It's like the difference between having like a thorn in your, in your shoe, which just kind of pokes you, and like, you know, a knife in your gut. This is like a knife in your gut, and uh, the game is over, chicken butt. Let's see the next problem. No basic introduction into the concept of the skewer between uh, the first couple of videos and this one would ever be complete without this very, very famous rook ending skewer. In this position, white would like to promote the pawn to the queen. However, moving the rook to any sort of passive square is simply going to lose the pawn. If he waits even just one move, black's king is pretty close and uh, probably won't hesitate to come over and help his buddy win this pawn on a7, right? So what can white play in this position that wins instantly? A very, very famous skewer, which is actually extremely practical to know, and I've used it in several rook endings to win in my own games. Of course, that move is sliding the rook over to the king's side. A move like rook to g8 and rook to f8 would also do the job, but we'll move the rook to h8, the furthest side of the board, simply to highlight that uh, after rook takes a7, even with the rook on the other side of Chinatown, we're still applying a deadly skewer, and after the king moves, white wins the rook, easily going on to win the ending. Again, we see this very famous skewer, the rook unleashes the threat of promoting, so simple things like checks would eventually run out, and he's going to be left in a position where he either has to take the pawn or allow it to promote. And once we see that the taking the pawn is constantly met by this deadly skewer and this famous rook ending instructive idea, um, we, we see the skewer in, complete in, uh, in full action. It's a very instructive one to know. Please make a, a mental note of that one and use it in your rook endings. Because imagine that this idea, of course, would work even if there were more pawns. On that note, we'll go ahead and set up a position with more pawns. In this position, white played the move h6, exclam, trying to get black to capture the h6 pawn, which would in turn allow the same idea, the same skewer we just saw. Right? Hopefully you paused your video and took a look at this. If, you'd like, if you haven't, you can pause now. As I've, Though I've shown you white's idea and white's threat to win, you can pause and see exactly what you might play as black in this position. Okay, and assuming your back will tell you that the uh, drawing move for black is the move king to g6, exclam, forcing white to trade this pawn now, after which the black king is in the corner and can't be forced out. What should be noted about this ending is that the skewer idea of coming to the back door does not exist when the black king on g7 guards the h7 square. If, if white was to make a random move with the king, the worst blunder black could make is, of course, moving to the f-file, which would in turn allow this famous skewer we saw in the last example happen again. But black's not that dumb, and in all of these positions, black simply waits in the corner, and you'll eventually notice that white has no progress to make in these types of rook endings. What happens is that when the king comes forward, as soon as it gets close to the pawn, while black, of course, just waits willy-nilly, as soon as that king is close to the pawn, we start checking. We check, we check, we can even give more checks for good measure, or as soon as the king is away, of course, we can just come back. And in this situation, as long as there's no skewer trick highlighted once again, as long as your king is not on f7, allowing that skewer, skewer trick, like I said, as long as your king isn't here, then this endgame is an easy draw. Black comes back behind the pawn, and uh, white has no way to unleash the rook without losing the pawn um, as long as the skewer trick does not exist. So make a, make a good mental note of the position you saw previous to this one and this one here, obviously giving you some rook ending knowledge as well, um, uh, on top of just highlighting the basic principle of the skewer, which maybe see in a couple more tactics throughout the uh, video here, but we're going to move on to the next example. We're back to discovered attacks. Quickly in this one, I just wanted to highlight the principle of moving backwards to forwards in your thinking, and that the end of this problem is one that I actually already displayed in uh, part two of, of the first video installment of this Patterns Everyone Must Know series. That is, white starts with this brilliant queen takes d5, which is actually a removal of the defender tactic, removing the knight's defense of e7. And after bishop takes, we play knight takes e7 check. And if you remember, I showed you a discovered sacrifice, a discovered check sacrifice, where we move the knight with check, 
then capture on d8 and take here. I really wanted to show this one just to show you that that position I initially gave you in, in part two was actually the stripped down version of a much more complicated position. Ding, 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 right? Danny's not, Danny's not full of it. He's uh, practicing what he preaches. So now all of a sudden you back up and look at a much trickier example, but if you're familiar with the discovered check sacrifice and remember that pattern, you should be able to solve this brilliant queen takes d5, bishop takes d5, check a ruski, check a lena Lashlamba, capture the girl, capture the b, and everybody's happy. Next problem. Remember to keep pausing your videos. Here we have white to move. In this position, white wants to move the move, make the move rook to c8, sorry, looking really good, right? If I capture the rook on c8 with either bishop or rook, I simply lose the, the queen on b6. However, the move queen to d6 removes the discovered attack threat and continues to guard my d8 rook. So what can we do in this position as white to create the potential for a discovered attack? This is where you start to take your knowledge of basic tactical patterns and actually make real life, real good decisions. That is the move e5, exclama biash. Um, many of you solving the position probably thought it was just a basic discovered attack and probably looked at rook c8 and just thought you were winning. Didn't even consider that I had queen to d6. I bet you would, and we'll see if you'll admit it in the comments section. That's right. I'm watching you right now through your computer. Um, totally joshing you. Nobody gets scared. Um, all right, so after e5, uh, the idea is that e5 is a brilliant positional move that threatens to blow open the king side. Black naturally wants to play a move like f5 to prevent my king from getting destroyed. Well, what does e5 also do? Ah, ding, ding, ding. It guards the d6 square, thus making this discovered attack. Um, and, of course, it's a discovered double attack. And just like many of these positions are, they're always repeating. Um, Black is resigning. If he takes the rook on c8, he loses the queen. If he takes the queen on e3, guess what we have? A Zwischenzug. We take with check before recapturing the queen on e3, and the game is over, Red Rover. Notice that if you captured back right away, you would just be down a rook, but the swish and zoog of check, followed by capturing the queen, is what makes this tactic eye candy, right? Let's look at that eye candy again. e5, exclaim of Yach, blowing open the king. Black's best move is probably to take away the discovery in some way, which of course would, would be devastating, and even taking e5 would also be devastating after a move like queen takes e5, with all kinds of threats coming for white. So we see this tactic in action one more time, and black resigns. Next discovery. The board is switched. This position is now black to play, a very famous discovered attacking pattern. You can pause the video if you haven't already. Black plays bishop to g1, exclaim a viage, threatening checkmate on h2, and discovering the attack of the rook to the queen. Very simple. Look at that pattern one more time. Bishop g1, a double attack, a discovery. The game is over. Next problem. Finally, we'll move on to a prophylactic discovery. In this position, white played the move knight to e5, creating a double attack on the queen on g6 and the knight on d7. Was that a good move for white? The answer, of course, is no. Knight e5 would walk into queen takes g2 check, king takes g2 c5, discovered check, winning back the material, and in a clearly better, perhaps winning endgame already for black. The best move for white was the move c5, closing in the horrible bishop on b7, and going on to have a much, much better middle game. Here we'll, uh, we'll leave the literal category of, of discovered attack behind and we'll move on to the more specific type of discovered attack, double check, which is the next pattern. In this position, white is threatening a devastating double check, devastating actually decoy that creates a double check mating net. And in the game, black missed it with this nice move knight to c4, forking the queen and bishop, thinking all is, uh, all is right in Pleasantville, right? But guess what? Queen to g7, a decoy tactic, forcing the king to g7. And notice, it's also a decoy, even though we're highlighting the double check theme here that occurs after this move. Without this sacrifice, without this sacrifice to bring the king to g7, without that decoy, the next move, the double check of knight f5, would not work. The king moves back to g8, and after knight h6, game over, Red Rover. Let's check it out again. Black makes a bad move, queen to g7 decoy recognizing the potential for our pieces to work together in this double check pattern. King has to go to g8, knight h6 checkmate, a very common, very famous mating net that you should be familiar with. It wouldn't really be fair for us to talk about discovered attacks or double check mating nets, uh, certainly not famous ones, without highlighting this one here. This, of course, is the Venus flytrap famous mating net, something that you will also see in the mating nets installment, but I figured there was not really any better example to show double checks and discovered attacks than this one. Knight f7 check. After king to g8, the move knight to h6 check is played, a double check. Notice how cute it is when you're giving a double check, yet both of your pieces are hanging. He's like, oh, I'd like to take that piece. Oh, right, it snaps it back. Oh, bloody hell, right? Oh, I'd like to take d5. Oh, no, no bueno, right? Oh, no, good for you. So the king moves. Here is checkmate. 
and here is the continuation of the Venus flytrap smothered mate, but that's not really the topic of this. The topic is to show the discovered double check in action captain, and uh, awesome when we see double check work for victory. Here we flip the board again, and you'll see that another very famous mating net that also involves a decoy and also involves a double check um, is this position here with black to play. If you haven't paused your video, go ahead. The winning move is queen to f1 check. And after king takes f1, bishop d3, double check again. And after the king moves to e1, we see the final climax, rook to e1 check. Again, to see this in action, we see queen f1 check, double check, rook to f1. Note that it wouldn't be possible without the initial queen f1 check decoy sacrifice. One of the last discovered says slash double checks we'll do here is a prophylactic one. And this position, white obviously has a brilliant discovered check to give, right? Yeah, do it quickly. Play knight b5 or knight d5, double check. Or sorry, a discovered check on the king and winning the queen, right? Wrong. Check out this little, I would classify this as a desperado interference double check. Knight to d4, double exclam. Giving check with the knight. Of course, the knight is completely hanging, but he can't be taken, because guess why? Oh, I'm also giving check with the queen, who's also hanging. Look at that, guys. After the knight moves, we give knight d4, double check. Neither one of these pieces is capturable, because the king is in check twice. And after he moves, he's mated by force. Look at that. If he had gone the other way, we would have checkmated him. And if he had gone the other way, we would have checkmated him. Pretty sweet when you see this sort of um, discovered check gone wrong, right? Good dog's gone bad. Well, guess what? Good double check's gone bad. In this position, we got a double check that actually really highlights for us that both pieces can be taken and, and it doesn't even matter. The double check is like the honey badger of checks, right? It doesn't even care. It just takes what it wants. All right, so that's a pretty good one to see in action. Let's move on to the decoy. Here we see a pretty famous decoy idea that um, leads us to a double attack. And that is the move B4, oops, excuse me, B4, exclam of Viage, right? Now you're attacking both the knight and the bishop, so obviously he has to take it, maintaining his threat on, C, on E1. But after knight to C2, we see that both of black's pieces come under fire, and neither one um, can live while the other survives, right? Yeah, I guess what I just did right there, a little Harry Potter reference for y'alls. After B4, bishop takes B4, knight C2, neither can live while the other survives. It's kind of cool to see a double attack by two pieces. Normally you see one piece doing the damage against two threats, right? Like two threats of checkmate or two different hanging pieces, like a fork of a knight, um, like a knight forking a king and queen. But in this position, we see a knight and king attacking two different pieces, which also classifies as a double attack, and it was only possible because of the decoy sacrifice b4 followed by knight to c2. A brilliant, brilliant idea for white and completely winning the endgame after winning a piece. Next problem. I wanted to take it up a notch before we end our discussion of the decoy and show you a really advanced, really tricky position for all of you strong chess players out there um, who are still watching. Well, here's one that you can think about with white to play. Ready, set, go. Okay, White's winning idea is a really, really strong decoy to take advantage of the king and involve a promotion tactic of, of being focused on getting that pawn to the other side of the board. White plays rook to e8 check, and after rook to king to a7, plays rook to a8 check, the first decoy sacrifice. The king can't capture it because of queen c8 check and checkmate on b7. So after the king moves to b6, we make another decoy sacrifice, queen a5 check. King has to capture it, because if he runs, we'll end up getting him in a mating net or checking twice and skewering the king to the queen, winning the endgame. So he captures on a5. We take with a discover check. Look how all these tactics come together. We promote. And in the end of this line, though um, it's, uh, it's kind of complex, the idea is that after b8 queen, king to c4, queen to c7 check, Queen to c5, there's a subtle move, queen to g3. This is not all um, expected for you to find. But after queen d5, queen b3 check, rook to d8, a sacrifice decoy, a final decoy to set up white with the skewer against the king and queen. To see that whole thing in action, it went slam, jam, bam, cram, thank you, ma'am, and I just ate a bowl full of flan. And... It tasted like jam. Okay, so uh, there we go. That was the uh, multiple version of a decoy sacrifice that eventually led to this winning skewer with the queen against queen crime, right? And uh, that should have been pretty fun. So for advanced players who uh, thought that this was all going to be just basic tactics, there's one I guarantee you didn't solve all the way.